Thank you, Paul. So hi, everyone. I'm Jim Begwadia. I'm the founder and CEO at Nirmata, a partner company with Cisco. What Nirmata does is we provide microservices operations and management, and we integrate with Cisco InterCloud, UCSD, and ICFD. So by background, I'm a software developer for probably the majority of the last couple of decades, and uh, my focus has been large-scale distributed systems, so really uh, happy to be talking about microservices here, and thank you for taking time out of the lunch hour to come and listen. So what we're going to cover from an agenda perspective is we'll start by defining what microservices are, and also trying to understand why people are you know, excited about microservices, especially developers like myself. And as we do that, we'll look at also some of the pros and cons. Because with any new technology, there's also some new complexities, some new challenges to solve. Uh, next, what we'll do is then we'll go into how you can start taking your monolith applications, your tiered applications, and moving them more to a microservices type of environment, right? And then we'll summarize and kind of wrap up on what all of this means and some next steps of what we can do. So let's start by looking at what microservices are and some of the motivations for these, right? So we know in the last few years, infrastructure as a service has become the way to deliver compute, network, storage, security, which lets you provision your data centers and your clouds, public or private. Now, what cloud computing has also done is, in addition to the transformation on the infrastructure side, there's a huge transformation going on at the application tier itself. And this is where you know, cloud has changed the way applications are developed, how they are deployed to customers as SaaS, and also how they are operated on public or private cloud. So what some of the pioneers in cloud computing have figured out is, you know, in the past it was always possible if you were a small team building a small application, you could be extremely agile and deliver a lot in a, a very small amount of time. But as the team grows, as the application grows, this becomes harder and harder, and you end up with three-month releases, six-month releases, maybe even 12-month release cycles, right? So I think we're all familiar with that experience. We have lived through it. What, with cloud computing, there's an opportunity to change that. And microservices is the, the buzzword, I guess, if you will, that's being used to describe what this means and how that's done. So what the pioneers in cloud have figured out is that you can now do agility at scale by starting to decompose your applications into these small components, small services, and leverage the underlying infrastructure as a service for that. So really, you know, no new technology comes out of nowhere, so it's an evolutionary step to get to where we are with microservices. And microservices builds on top of object-oriented and modular design, uh, something that we, you know, in the 90s and 80s, this was uh, the popular uh, topic of the day. And then we had service-oriented architectures in the early 2000s, which never really got popular because maybe they were a little bit too early for their time. Um, but microservices also incorporates those principles, and it incorporates DevOps for operations and management. So bringing development teams and operation teams together in how they build and operate these solutions. So if we start putting this together and look at what exactly is a microservices style application, so this is where an application is composed of multiple runtime services, and each service follows five important constraints. Each service is designed to be elastic, so you can scale it up and down independently. Each service is resilient to failures, so if a single instance goes down, your entire application is not really impacted by this. And each service, importantly, is composable, right? Because at the end of it all, it is one application that we're delivering, so these services need to cooperate and work together. And the micro part of it comes in when the service is minimal, uh, but yet it needs to be complete so that it's loosely coupled with other services as part of your application. Right, so that's a, you know, that's a definition that we use for microservices to try and understand what are some of the constraints and how you would put these together. So if you look at the pros and cons, um, the main factor, the main reason like we were discussing why uh, DevOps teams, application developers are moving to this, is to gain agility. And there's a few different things here which are important, right? 
first of all, if you're doing things in small chunks, it, it gets simpler to do. I mean, that's pretty much a no-brainer, we understand that. Um, but what it also happens here is, as you get new people into your team, you no longer have this huge, large, you know, maybe five million lines of code to go through and understand what those are. You can deal with small subsets and understand these services because each one of these is an independent business function or a runtime component. This also empowers now small teams to develop as well as operate their application layer uh, independently and autonomously than other teams. Because in this style of application, each service is its versionable unit of deployment rather than versioning and compiling and integrating the entire application as a monolith. The other aspect of this uh, continuous delivery is now that we have smaller portions and if each service is, is elastic and resilient, you can have multiple versions of the same service running in your production environment at the same time. This was something which was not really possible before and you can do things like canary launches and A-B testing on these applications which gives you a lot of agility and really paves the way towards continuous delivery. So those are you know, some of the important agility reasons. We also talked about scalability, because now that each service is elastic, you can scale them up or down based on load, and it's important that you need to be able to go both ways, because if you're not, you know, and that's the next factor, where you get the best resource efficiencies only if you can scale down things just as rapidly as you can scale up things, right? Um, another very interesting aspect of microservices is how, because you can now decompose your applications and do things in a more independent manner, teams can make decisions on what's the best language, what's the best tooling or database technology for that service. You no longer have to make that decision for an entire large monolith, which requires a lot of organizational coordination, right? So you can experiment fairly quickly and safely, because you can roll out a new version, test it out, and if it doesn't work, roll it back. And, and all of this happens if you're using containers. Uh, it happens very rapidly in milliseconds, rather than you know, what used to take uh, perhaps minutes or hours or even weeks sometimes to deploy an update. But, like we were saying, nothing comes without a price, right? So you get all of this good stuff. There's more operational complexity because now you have so many different components running. I mean, if you listen to talks from Netflix and others, they literally have hundreds of services running in production at any given point. How do you manage all of these components? How do you make sure that you know, your application is still delivering with the right SLAs and all of your infrastructure is performant as well? Also, on the programming side, you know, uh, somebody said, I, I don't know who quoted this, but people, uh, someone said that today every application, whether it's mobile or web, any application you're developing is a distributed application. Microservices are, uh, really amplifies this, because now within one application boundary, you need to follow lots of distributed you know, uh, programming patterns, like doing things like leader elections, distributed locking, to coordinate activities in those services. Um, and also in communicating across components, you're gonna have some, you make sure that you, know, you have uh, the right performing networks, the right performing uh, infrastructure VMs, because you do have a lot more hops to perhaps for a single uh, user request or anything like that. And there are, again, design patterns to deal with this, but just things to keep in mind as we move towards microservices. So just kind of you know, a few words before you embark on a journey towards microservices. Um, some things to keep in mind is th this isn't a silver bullet that's going to fix existing design issues, existing software issues. So if you don't have a modular design, it's going to be hard to get to a service-oriented architecture or a microservices architecture. Right, so those are some things you probably want to do first. Also, you know, it, it, it's good to learn and practice some of these concepts on a monolith, especially when it comes to automated delivery, uh, building in the right tooling and the right you know, ways to get your code into production. You can containerize a monolith application, put it in a single Docker container, for example, 
and build all the automation for that before you try to do that for 50 containers or 100 or 1,000 containers. So those are probably good steps to you know, try and practice before you uh, really embark on the microservices journey. So now that we have kind of have an understanding or a level set of what microservices are, and some of the challenges, the pros and cons. Let's talk about, you know, if you have a monolith application, and I think all of us, most applications today are monoliths, or like we were describing, if you start a new application, it's probably best to start it as a monolith and then start, you know, decomposing towards microservices. So let's talk about some of the ways you can do that. So one pretty, you know, straightforward way, and something which is always a good starting point, is every time you have a new feature you need to develop, you can uh, evaluate whether that feature would be best developed as something which is compiled and integrated into your monolith, or can you split that apart as its own service? A great example of this uh, is things like reporting, or analytics, or any sort of you know, big data type of technologies. If you're pushing things upstream, you might as well make that a cloud service, provide the right interfaces, let your application you know, stay the way it is, but separate out those components. And using design patterns like you know, an adapter uh, or a proxy pattern, your local modules will still think they're interacting with a local component, and you can pass REST messages back into your service. So that's a great way to start and you know, take, take the first step towards microservices. By the way, here I'm gonna use the Java pet store as an example, and for those of you who are Java programmers, you'll recognize some of the concepts here, but it was just an easy example to choose and uh, start using. Another interesting way uh, to look at how to decompose microservices is uh, something called Conway's Law. And this is a very interesting observation, and you probably see this in your, uh, you know, your uh, companies and businesses too. So over time, what Conway's Law states is that over time, organizations start mirroring the communications within a system. So think about it. If you have two or three separate teams, you are most likely going to have APIs or interfaces across those teams, uh, and that's you know the, the teams sort of organized around the system. But then once you have an organization in place, that starts influencing the system as well, right? So there is a loop here, and it's something to be aware of as architects, uh, as developers. And sometimes it's not always a good thing, but uh, in, in many cases you can leverage this. And so, for example, if you're looking for where to split your monolith into microservices, maybe a good place to start is at the team boundaries or the organization boundaries. So that's just another tip or technique in terms of how you can do this. Another you know, interesting place to start or look at is take a look at your data set itself. And here again, going back to the pet store example, we have you know, multiple tables, but you'll see there's some logical grouping in these tables itself. Like for example, there's a catalog set of things which models how your pets are, you know, the store stored in the database. And then there's some user sort of information as well as orders information. And these really seem like discrete or separate sets of data which you can use to kind of start formulating your service boundaries for how you take your monolith and break into separate uh, databases. You may also, as you're doing this, you may want to understand what is the best data management technology for each one of these. Some things, maybe you're using your database really as a cache. Maybe you can move to something like Redis instead of you know, uh, a persistent store, right? So it's an interesting time to kind of analyze what each set of components need uh, in terms of data usage and start making those decisions. So the fourth way to look at how to decompose is you know, just again going back to modular design and design best practices, so, uh, trying to understand the coupling and the cohesion across modules. So if you follow good object-oriented or even other modular design practices, uh, the idea is that you have high cohesion within the module. So the, the, that mean, really means that things within the module do related things, right? So you're servicing one function, 
but you have loose coupling across the modules. So you have some well-defined stable interfaces across your modules. Now if you do have a modular design and you can start measuring the cohesion and coupling, uh, it's pretty straightforward to say, okay, maybe you just take those modules, put REST APIs or other APIs around them, and start making these your initial set of microservices. So that's one other way which, which you can start decomposing your monolith uh, and get into more of a service-oriented architecture. The other thing I would recommend is if you're doing this, again, start examining the need for splitting out those modules, because maybe even if they're loosely coupled, it may be fine to just start with two or three major services and then move into uh, more modular or more service-oriented concepts. The fifth way of, of trying to look at how to take an application and split it into microservices is examining the APIs that you already have in place. So you may have, you know, let's say uh, your interface to your UI, maybe through let's, a REST API like is shown over here, or could be through other technologies, but you may already have well-defined interfaces, and perhaps in your user interface you have different roles, different folks using your system. So if you have a different set of users doing catalog entry, maybe that really deserves to be its own service, uh, rather than be something which is you know, combined with other services. So this is another related but uh, different way of taking a look at your system and the boundaries on your system and how to organize those. Now I'm going to switch. So we looked at functional and design elements, but we'll switch more to runtime elements of how you can you know, take, again, monolith applications, think about ways to decompose them into services. So one interesting aspect is we said microservices provide more resiliency, but the resiliency is only achieved if your application can stay up and running even when certain components fail. So it could be various service instances of the same service, or it could be even entire components. So it's interesting to analyze what all is compiled and built into your monolith and if you do have clear boundaries, like say for example here, if a rating system or some other system can be, be you know, can go down for some amount of time, your entire application may stop, uh, uh, still stay up and running. Uh, and your users may not notice that outage unless they happen to be using that particular feature. So by decomposing by domain functions, you can get that resiliency. There's also a very good book called Domain Driven Design which talks about this, and they call this the bounded context pattern, where you have an entire business function which is loosely coupled with other business functions uh, to provide this kind of resiliency. The seventh way you could decompose now microservices uh, into, towards microservices from a monolith is looking at scalability. So if different modules, different components in your system have different scaling requirements, like you see there's one module which requires a lot of CPU, a lot of memory, but others which are fairly lightweight and not often used, perhaps you could take that module, split it apart, and make that elastic in itself. So that's uh, another good way to kind of, you know, or maybe another dimension you could use to start splitting your monolith into a service-oriented architecture. The last way I'm going to kind of mention, and this you know, something, again, you might want to combine with some of the design and functional patterns, is looking at the rate of change. So if you have in your system, there will be some layers, some abstractions, which are very stable, right? Maybe you haven't uh, touched anything, uh, f fixed bugs in them for a long amount of time, but then there's newer modules, newer features, which are constantly changing. So you may want to look at those as, again, because microservices lets you deliver those on a different release cycle, you may want to look at separating those out and moving them into their own service there initially, and then looking at the other modules which are more stable. You could also do something where you could treat the stable modules perhaps as a backing service, 
So maybe you have you know, um, some sort of you know, catalog service or other services which doesn't change very often. Maybe you're doing your, uh, those entries once every few months. You could make that a separate backing service even you know, and, and which other environments, other applications can use, uh, whether it's for internal consumption or external. So just to kind of recap what we talked about and how, you know, how to approach this problem. So today, microservices is a may. The reason why we're all excited about this is it gives you a, a way to be agile at scale. As your systems grow, at you, as your teams grow, you can still maintain the level of agility you had when you were a small team, perhaps a startup, or you know, just a few people working on that same application code. With all the benefits of microservices, there's also challenges, right? And that's really in the operational complexity um, and in some of the other tooling requirements, the distributed programming requirements that you need with microservices. So that's something to make sure that you're ready for as you move into this journey from monolith to microservices. And today, you know, what we talked about is eight simple ways you could use to take a look at your existing apps both from a design perspective as well as a runtime perspective, and come up with the roadmap, come up with a plan for how you could evolve these towards microservices. So that's all I had for content for this talk, uh, but I do also want to point out there are a set of related talks that we had, one which I did yesterday. Uh, there are videos available for these if you weren't able to catch them live. And there are some other upcoming uh, you know, sessions and talks on microservices and containers. There's also, we're doing a demo of you know, microservices operations and management on Cisco InterCloud as well as with UCSD and ICF. Uh, it's in the CloudPod 3, so come check it out over there and um, you, can, you can see some of this in action. So with that, you know, I, I think we have about 10 minutes or so left for question and answers, uh, so we'll be happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, what are some of the typical interfaces between these microservices? Are they REST APIs, something else? Right, so REST over HTTP has sort of become the de facto standard. But there is, you know, there, it's a mix of REST APIs as well as asynchronous messaging. So you see a lot of, you know, and typically it's also like JSON in those asynchronous messaging. Uh, but like Apache Kafka, RabbitMQ, those are very popular tools for the async components of them. Yeah, I had a similar question just about security. So obviously you were putting up a, a lot of APIs there. Uh, and right. How do you manage that security? Right. Yeah, so uh, and that's a great question, right? Because now you have an application which is composed of all these runtime services, but you still you know, want to layer security at your application boundaries to begin with. The other aspect of this is now each, whether it's a VM or a container you're delivering, you need some security at that level. And Adrian Cockcroft, you know, who I mentioned as one of the speakers, he has a separate video just focused on security for microservices, which covers a lot of this in great detail. So security certainly, it's interesting, it goes from, from towards the middle tier to uh, you know, every container, every host has to be concerned about security, as well as to the edge of the application where you want to layer the right security policies. Any other questions or? All right, well, thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of your day and your time. Yeah. Yeah.